Welcome to the Friday Happy Hour with Victory Strategist, award-winning author and your Happy Hour host, Anne-Marie Kelly. Each week, Anne-Marie chats with women who have reinvented, started over or wrote fabulous next chapters. They share how they overcame their midlife challenges and how you can too. So kick back with some good happy hour something to drink and enjoy today's show. to the Friday Happy Hour with me and Marie Kelly. I'm that recovering good girl and your victorious woman empowerment partner. And this is a place for us victory chicks and you men who care about us meet on Fridays to wrap up the work week and find ways to live more powerfully and make our lives sparkle. You know, by the time you get to 45 or 50, you start realizing that you have more working years behind you than in front of you. And sometimes that's a good thing, but with that realization comes the cold, hard fact that retirement isn't as far down the pike as it once was. And while you might be too young or too active to fully retire, you might be glad to stop working the big money job to pursue that long, put-off passion. Well, at Friday Happy Hour, we talk a lot about reinventions and second careers, but many times there's a missing link. And it's the thing that keeps us up at night. And that is, will I have enough money? Whether you want to retire at 62 or 67, or you want to take a buyout and start your own business, you wonder, will that be enough to live on? Whatever that money is, will that be enough to live on? And do you ever wonder when you see a 75-year-old woman work in the cash register at Macy's, if she's doing it because she loves working here, and loves the discount, or is she working because she has to work to live? Personally, I always prefer thinking that she's doing it because she loves being out with others and she loves the discount. I would do that. I would do something like that. But I'd want to do it for choice, not necessity. So that's why financial expert Jane Bryant Quinn is coming to happy hour today. I've been reading her financial advice for years. And if you get the AARP Monthly Bulletin, you've been reading it in that her column there that she's been doing for a long time. And now she's written a new book, How to Make Your Money Last, The Indispensable Guide to Retirement. So she'll be here in just a few minutes. I have a slew of questions for her. And if you have a question, you can call at 610-701-9243 or go to my Facebook page at Victorious Woman Project. If you're nervous about calling, go to my Facebook page at Victorious Woman Project. I pin the post with Jane's picture there at the top of the page, at the top of my wall, and you can ask your question on Facebook. So, listen, we're in the final days of the political season, and it seems like it's never-ending. And I'll bet, like me, you've been listening to all the political things these past few weeks. So what do you think? Have you ever seen a presidential race like this one? Right now, it seems like Donald Trump is behaving himself and Hillary's in good health. But last week, it was Cokie Roberts who was saying that she thinks the Democrats are trying to figure out how to get Hillary out and someone else in. Now, that's never going to happen. But she's Louise with just over six weeks to go. And the first debate this Monday, the media is going crazy. I think I've said it to you before, if it was Trump against Joe Biden, there wouldn't even be a contest. But Trump against Hillary? Jeez. You you have the never-Trumpers, and then you have the ABC voters, you know, anybody but Clinton. And it's kind of amazing. Well, on Wednesday, I went to the press club luncheon at the Fabios and Media, and the speaker was a polling expert, James Lee, who does political research. And frankly, when I saw the topic, I expected it to be a snooze. But James Lee was fascinating. He started out by saying this is the only race he's ever known where both political candidates are as disliked across the board, for different reasons by different constituencies, but just disliked. Well, that part wasn't news, 
But for me, he got really interesting when he drilled down to just Pennsylvania. Because here in PA, we usually go blue, that is, vote Democratic. But in this craziest of political seasons, some think Pennsylvania is actually in play. And for a very interesting reason, when you look at the map of the state, the, the, based on the current polling, the Trump supporters are in the counties that are across the top of the state and down the center. And those counties form a T. It's not for Trump, but I, but they are the Trump voters. So I think that's pretty interesting and kind of a little freaky. However, the southeast and southwest corners, that's Philly and Pittsburgh, are way smaller in geography, but way bigger in the concentration of people. And those two heavily populated cities and much of their surrounding suburbs are strongly for Hillary. So the real key to either candidate's win in Pennsylvania, as best as I can tell, is going to rest on voter turnout. The Trump people who live in that T are more passionate about Trump winning and are more likely to turn out on Election Day. The Philly and Pittsburgh people, largely Democratic, and are less enthusiastic about Hillary. Same with the independents. And the Republican in those areas aren't embracing Trump the way that they may normally have embraced, replaced their party's candidates. So though there are some more voters in the Northeast and Southwest, they are more likely to stay home. Kind of crazy, huh? And then maybe it all depends on the weather. You know, rain could make the disinterested voter, voter who thought maybe, I'll, well, I'll go and vote for my candidate. Well, the, the rain could make them decide it's too much trouble to go out to vote. So with PA being a key state for the winner, this whole election could turn out that it rests on Mother Nature. How bizarre is that? But as important as the election is, there's something else big going on in my house. Joseph and I are moving out of, out of our moving our guest room out of our loft and onto the second floor. And wait till you hear why. It's a sign my friends are getting older. We're moving it so that our overnight guests can be closer to the bathroom. You see, I, I thought the loft gave loft gave my guests more privacy. But there's no bathroom there, but it has more privacy. When my mother lived with us that summer, she loved it there. The last time we had guests, the overnight guests, I asked my friend what she thought, and she said she and her spouse have to get up during the night at least once and would rather be closer to the bathroom. Well, then I thought about it, and I thought, well, I don't want anybody falling down the stairs just to pee. So, so the switch is on, but with one major problem. The bedroom has become over... Uh, has. Is becoming that it, the bedroom that's becoming the new guest room has for 10 years been the overflow room for my work stuff, particularly my books, and it's cluttered. I'm kind of a slob. So that's about to change. So last Saturday, Joseph and I went out in search of a new bookcase for my home office. I didn't want anything fancy, and I especially didn't want anything expensive. And after searching a dozen stores, literally a dozen stores, I found what I wanted at Boscov's. I bought one of those pretend wood bookcases that you have to put together. And when we first went to the pickup area, we weren't so sure we would have enough room <clears throat> excuse me, in the car for it. The box was very heavy, but so compact that it fit very easily. And then when I saw it and realized how many pieces that must have been squished into that box, all I could think was how many arguments Joseph and I would have trying to decipher the instructions. I was already starting to re regret my decision. But then on Sunday... <clears throat> Joseph opened the box and began taking the pieces to our second floor. He meticulously sorted out every panel, screw, and hinge so we would be ready. And then he moved the first pieces into the hallway where the construction would take place. Finally, Joseph called me and we began. And my main job was to read the instructions and keep the cursing to a minimum. And my goal was to prevent, my personal goal was to prevent having to patch a wall where someone's hammer ended up you know, or someone's fist, not mine. We worked on it for about two, and a, two hours, and to my great pleasure, with only about a half dozen arguments over instructions, and just so you know, I actually read them, we were done. We nailed that wood-looking cardboard back to the constructed pieces, moved it office furniture around to make room, moved the new bookcase in, and voila, there it was, ready for about 200 books. And it looks great. 
well, you know, it's that pretend wood, so you know what that looks like. But for my home office, it's fine. I think it leans a little, too, but, uh, you know, I'm not going to be taking a level to it. It's what I needed fast, and it's done. And then my real work began. The bookcase isn't quite big enough for everything, so I had to toss stuff. And did you ever notice how much useless crap you save, especially, especially at work? I haven't belonged to... Uh, I, I'm not sure why I was keeping those 10-year-old newsletters from an organization I haven't belonged to for about six years. Or the seven membership directories. Yes, seven from the early 2000s. I, you know, I looked at the names and thought, I'll bet not one of these people still works at any one of these companies. So I let them go. But, geez, I only scratched the surface of the great decluttering. The good news is that when you declutter, you make room for new and better, and I'm working on my next book, so I was totally wholesome about letting go of the old stuff that predated even my first book. So I'm letting go of old stuff and getting ready for new stuff, and I'm excited. And I'm excited to talk to Jane Bryant Quinn. I, I've been reading her finance columns for years, and she always has good advice, and maybe you've been reading them too. So today we're talking money and retirement. So go get some good happy hour something to drink, and Jane will be here when you get back. You are listening to the Friday Happy Hour. Hi, this is Anne Marie Kelly, author, victory strategist, and the radio show host of the Friday Happy Hour. I trust you're enjoying my conversation with this fabulous, victorious woman. If you're getting inspired with ideas and feeling empowered, this is just the tip of the iceberg. There's more for you. Tips, downloads, resources at the Victorious Woman Project. Go to victoriouswoman.com and look around and get on my mailing list so you can be the first to know about the newest good things I have for you. That's www.victoriouswoman.com. Welcome back to the Friday Happy Hour. I'm Amory Kelly, and I'm with financial journalist Jane Bryant Quinn. Jane, I've been reading your financial information for years, and now... I read your column in the AARP Monthly Magazine. Well, thank you, so, Anne Marie. How are you doing I, today? I'm delighted. I'm doing very well today. Thanks. And you? I hope you have a good day. We have a beautiful day here in New York. Jane, are you there? I can't. Hello. Yes. Oh. Jane? Hello? Yeah, yes. Jane, we had, we had a little technical difficulty, but we're squared away now. <laughs> All right, good. <laughs> so, so listen, I'm curious, how did you get into doing this work? Into financial reporting, you mean? Yep. Uh, it was absolutely serendipitous, Anne-Marie. The only thing I wanted to be from the age of 15 on is a reporter. And so I did, a, I did you know, high school newspapers, that sort of thing. And when I went to New York and looked for a job, I fell into a job at a newsletter which was covering the consumer movement. And there are a lot of financial issues, of course, and consumer issues. And so the editor said to me, you do the money stories. And I said, but I don't know anything about money. I'm 21 years old. I'm just, you know, I'm just starting my life. Right. And she said, learn. <laughs> and so... Oh, I started reading the books and the papers and doing the reporting and calling people. And, and so I learned and I discovered that I loved it. I would not have had a clue that I was going to turn out to be a financial reporter. Mm -hmm. Reporter, yes. Finance was a surprise. It turned out I loved it and I've been in it all my life. Wow. I, I'm trying to remember when I first started reading your columns and I'm, I, I'm wondering if it was like for Glamour or Cosmo or I, w I was in Good Housekeeping. I was in Woman's Day. I was in Woman's Day first. So maybe that's where you first mm -hmm. encountered my column. Yeah, I, I, I didn't write for Cosmo. Okay. I, well, but it was a woman's magazine. I remember starting yep. to notice you in Woman's, woman's Day. Magazine. And then I switched to Good Housekeeping. Uh, and those were really good columns to write. They were great audience, a lot of very smart, interested women. Mm. But you know what, Jane, from, you know, from, for both of us, our work with women, you know, you and I both know so many women want to ignore their finances and ignore retirement and just hope it turns out okay. And in, in your book, How to Make Your Money Last, I think you refer to it as waiting for the retirement fairy. 
Well, yes. <laughs> Waiting for the retirement ferry is something that people do, I think, when they're younger. And then when they get a little bit older, they start saying, hey, the retirement ferry is me, and what am I going to do about mm. it? But you know, Anne-Marie, I think that uh, there's a lot of a bad rap on women here, as if women were the only people who pretend retirement is not coming up. Do you know, men are in the same boat very often. I find young men, men in their 30s, not even thinking about it either. So there certainly is a tendency for some women maybe to say, I'm going to let the man in my life take care of it. But you would be surprised how many men are just as oblivious. And I, and also, you know, Marie, so many women are working now, so they have in their at their job, they have a 401k plan, and their employer says, are you going to sign up? And so I find women are far more aware of uh, retirement savings than they were certainly when I was a young woman. Well, and, and you know, a lot of women, at that going back before they had pensions and, and 401ks, they, they didn't even think about getting an IRA, and some women still don't, but, but, they, but now at least they... If they have it through their company, they're thinking about it. That's the key to me, uh, Anne-Marie, and I think it's there's a huge unfair retirement saving system in this country because if you work for a company that offers you a 401K or a 403B and you can have it automatically taken out of your paycheck, uh, you're in great shape, and, and these are the people who are most apt to have savings when they retire. If you are working for yourself, you're in the gig economy, you are... Uh, uh, working for a small company that doesn't offer a 401k, uh, you are, then you have to do it all yourself. And the people who find it difficult to save are th- this group of people. And it's mm. just not fair. There's one group of people that makes where their employers make it easy and it comes right out of their paycheck. There's another group of people that have to do it themselves. And I think that there should be some requirement that everybody have something on the equivalent of a 401k that can come out of your paycheck so that you can save automatically. That's what works best. Well, you know, Jane, I've been self-employed for probably on and off, but for the most part of my my working life, I've been self-employed. So that's a special, that's an extra special challenge. Yes, yeah, especially indeed. in the early years. Yes, because because there's no one to do it for you or to help you. Right. You know, we all. So many people tell me they can't save because they're living paycheck to paycheck, and that's true. You know, you spend what is in your checking account, mm-hmm. but if you have someone taking money out of your paycheck automatically, putting it into retirement savings, so you don't see it in your checking account, what happens is that you still live paycheck to paycheck. You mm-hmm. spend what's in the checking account, but now you are saving money on the side. Mm-hmm. And it's this, that's the way I first started to save, and it's this automatic savings that make it work. And mm-hmm. I just think, I, I, I'm self-employed. I've been self-employed most of my life, too. And this automatic savings is just the way that it works. And it's just, I just don't think it's fair. And so many people are, I mean, half of our working people don't. They didn't say, oh, you don't have an IRA. Well, you don't have anybody to help you do it or make it be an automatic contribution. You know, it's funny. I had two interns last year, and and I, I can't remember how it came up, but I was like, now listen, you girls, you're in your early 20s. Start putting some money. Open up an IRA. Start putting some money in it. It's going to make a lot more money in your 20s than, than for me putting the same amount of money. And they just looked at me like I had six heads. That's right. You know? <laughs> but, but if those same uh, young people had worked for a company with a 401K, they would have signed up because it was yep. part of the sign-up process, yeah. and that's the difference. And I just, I just think it's there are a lot of unfair things in this society of ours. But from when you're looking at retirement savings and ability to save money, the, the fact that some of us, for some of us, our employers make it easy, and for others of us, we just don't get that easy way of saving money, and I just think it's completely unfair. Now, some states are trying to get things set up for for people who are self-employed and and, uh, more power to them. 
Well, I have to tell you, I read your book, How to Make Your Money Last, The Indispensable Retirement Guide, and it's packed with detailed information. And I'll be honest, I, I'm glad I didn't read it in one sitting. But I have to tell you, after reading it all, I loved getting to the very last chapter that, that you call, Just Tell Me What to Do. <laughs> That's I, I appreciate your mentioning that because, of course, how to make your money last, this is the big challenge for people because we are living so much longer, Anne-Marie. I mean, look at our lifespans. It's, uh, you know, 85 average and, and many. My, my mother, we celebrated her 101st birthday wow. last April, nice. and she's fine and going strong toward her 102nd. Our lifespans are much longer than we mm-hmm. expect, and when you retire, if you do have savings, of course, Social Security will be with you for life, but otherwise, you say, how do I make my savings last Mm -hmm. for I don't know how long I'm going to live? How much can I afford to spend now? How much do I have to save for later? And so, you know, so I go through all these things in my book, how to budget and uh, how to invest and how to save and what you should do with your pensions. But but that last chapter, I, I was writing the book and I said, you know, I have to put this together somehow. And I said, I know. Just and tell I'm me what to do. Yeah, I'm do glad this, that you do did this. because because the, you know you go into intricate details and and there were times when my head just my eyes crossed my head and went like oh <laughs> but when I got to that last chapter all the tension out of figuring out my financial plan left because you highlight the you highlight the phases you know pre retirement retirement and so on and then you give an 18 point checklist that summarizes everything so. In fact, Jane, here's what I, I here's what I would tell my listeners who want to read your book. Read the first chapter, which is about retirement in general, and then read the last chapter, and then then read the rest of the book because then you're going to know what you're looking for. That would work. Yeah, actually, that would that would work very well because you get your mind around it. There are more details in the in the chapters in between, of course, because people are in different situations. Mm-hmm. Some people are married, some people are divorced, some people uh, uh, health insurance is more of a problem than it is for other people, and so you, you know I have to cover all of these subjects. For you know, some people have pensions and some people don't have pensions, so you need to kind of work through different people in different situations. Mm-hmm. But I actually think, I hadn't thought about that, and Maureen, I think that's an excellent idea to read that checklist, get your mind around what you are looking for in your personal situation as far as uh, saving for retirement and, and how to make your money last through retirement, and then go go find yourself in the book. Yep, and that's exactly, like when I got there, I was like, wow, this is great, because, and then because I read it, I knew, like, oh, well, that part's in that chapter, that part in that chapter. So I thought that was good. But well, you know, thank Jane, you. Jane you, when you talk about preparing for a successful retirement, what, do you, what does that mean to you, a successful retirement? It means a number of things. I think initially, at the very start, it means being happy with yourself. You know, some people find it extremely difficult to retire, and they they aren't sure what their identity is anymore and who they are. You know, they identify with their jobs. They aren't sure what to do. They are worried about money. And so, to, to me, the successful retirement is first you you chop off your working life and you say I'm now a new person I am somebody with with maybe 30 years ahead of me and I need to create a new life for myself not as a worker but as a as a successful American citizen doing something in the world. And so so that's a mental attitude. Mm-hmm. You need to find something to do. I mean, you're not going to sit around and watch television for the next 30 years. That is yeah, that pretty is, boring. <laughs> yeah, I, I had a rotator cuff done, and, and I was like in a recliner for three months. And 
that that watching television all day long wears out pretty thin. <laughs> yeah, can you imagine it for 30 years? Yeah. And but then the other thing, of course, which is what my book deals with, is the financial part. Right. And that is what I call right sizing your life. You know, maybe you retire and you've got a million dollars and everything's wonderful and you can just go on living the way you always did. But that's not what happens with most of us. You know, you need to look at how much money you are coming in, how much have coming in, how much you can afford to spend from your savings, and then work out a lifestyle that is going to be to, to match with the income you have. And once you've done that, then you don't have to worry about money anymore. You worry about money at any age if you're spending more than your income. Right. So right-sizing your life when you're you know, planning retirement and going into retirement and saying, you know, if I, if I have this level of expenses and live here and do this, I'm going to have enough money to last for the rest of my life. So well, Gina, you right-size your life and you figure out what you're going to do with the rest of your life. I want to talk about... There are two pieces of that I want to talk about when we come back from a break. So we're going to go away. We'll come back in just a minute or two. And everybody just hang in there with us. You are listening to the Friday Happy Hour. Are you one of those women who lived the first part of your life as a really good girl? That is, you did all the right things and followed all the so-called rules for women. I was like that too. But have you noticed that once you passed 40, you have less patience for those rules? Maybe you even think that the rules really don't make sense for you anymore. Maybe they never did, and you just didn't realize it. Do you want to go where other recovering good girls meet to inspire each other and support their new, empowered selves? Then join me, Anne-Marie Kelly, and some very fabulous Victorious women. We're on Facebook at The Victorious Woman Project. So go to facebook.com forward slash Victorious Woman Project. I'll talk to you there. Welcome back to the Friday Happy Hour. I'm Anne-Marie Kelly, and I'm here with financial journalist Jane Bryant Quinn. And, Jane, uh, here's one of the things. In, in that first chapter, you talk about asking yourself, you know, before you even go to, to a retirement planner or do a calculator or a social security or anything else, you, you say to ask yourself, what am I going to do for the rest of my life? Yes. And you know what, Jane? You were singing my song because I think that is so critically important to happiness and and even longevity. But but you know what? If if I'm trying to get through the day and I have kids in college or I'm helping my kids with their kids, you know, they, it's, it's hard to do. But tell my listeners why that's so important. Well, you need, we all need to have a purpose in life, Anne-Marie. And, 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 you know, if you're taking care of your grandchildren all day, well, that's a pretty good purpose. I, I buy that. I'm babysitting with one of my grandchildren next week for three days, and I can hardly wait. Nice. But, <laughs> but you need to have, you need to have the feeling that you are contributing. And this is, can be particularly difficult for people who have um, identified with work all their lives. You know, if you've been a teacher, you've been a lawyer, you've been a whatever, and then you retire and you, you aren't a teacher anymore and you aren't a lawyer anymore and you say, so who am I and what do I do? And this makes me think of your story about being, you know, in the, in the recliner for three months. Mm-hmm. You, know, you, you can't do that for the rest of your life. If you retire at 65, you're going to live at least 20 years. Maybe you'll live live 30 years. And you need to say, uh, and we all need to say, where do we fit in? And and there are there are charity things, there are part time things. You can help your children or your grandchildren. Uh, there are there are so many things to be done in the world. I mean, you know, this year you can volunteer for a, a, a political campaign. I mean, I in fact I put a, a list in that chapter of things that you might consider doing. A long List. Uh, you know what? That, it is, Jane. And, and like one of the things that I have to tell you that I thought was especially interesting and shared with my spouse, you talk about doing, uh, go, getting a job at a national park. Yes. And I thought, oh, that's great. We could go all over the country and, and work for a national park as a seasonal worker. 
Yeah, people do that. In, in RVs, there is a great deal of that you know, in the summer. They're looking for people. They're looking and retired people. I mean, if you visit national parks, as I do, how many retired people do you see as docents or in, or in presidential homes and all of these things around the country? Hmm. There are so many things you can do, and you just need to start saying, what do I like? What have I liked in the past? Maybe uh, what did I like when I was young, but I haven't had time to do it for the past four years? I mean, I'm thinking of taking guitar lessons. Mm. I always wanted to take guitar oh, lessons. Nice. And I, said, I said, you know, maybe, I, maybe that's something that I'm going to want to do with myself. A, a dear friend of mine who um, plays the flute, uh, who played it when, in high school, has taken it up again, and she now has a group she plays with. So oh, it's um, that, that's why I put that long list in, mm-hmm. in that. How are you? What are you going to do with your retirement? Because sometimes people just need something to, like, as you said, work for a national park. You said, oh, that's something that could work for me. Mm-hmm. There are so many things to do, and and so right sizing your life financially is key, but right sizing your life emotionally and productively is also key. These years that we have where you can do what you want. I mean, you, you don't have to go to a job anymore. You don't have to do this. You don't have to do that. And that can become very challenging. So you want to construct a life that you look forward to. So you get up in the morning and say, this is going to be fun. I'm going to do this today. Mm-hmm. And and I and that's a lot of the work that I do is, is helping women to figure that out. But, but in your case, it's, here's the thing, Jane. Once you decide that you know maybe I want to write the next great American novel or I want to travel the world or I want to express myself in some artistic something you in in your book you explain that that's all well and good but you you need the money to pay for it so if I'm in my 40s or 50s or 60s how do I know how much money I'll need well when, by the time you are in your mid to late 50s early 60s you should have a pretty good bead on that uh, because you know how you are living, you know something about what you would like to do, you know something about your health, you know something about how long you hope to stay in the workforce. And so at that point, you you look at how much money you have saved. Uh, one hopes you've been able to save some money up to that point and say how and how you want to live. And then you say, is the money that I have enough to live the way I want? And I have a budget there and the way you can figure all of this out in the book. And if the answer is no, I would have to downsize tremendously and I don't want to do that, then at that point you say, okay, I have to work longer and I, or I have to start spending less now or maybe I should sell my house and go into a smaller condominium now. So you can start making decisions. In your 40s, that's harder to do because uh, retirement at this point is, you know, what, 20, 25 years away. Mm. In your 40s, you should be saying, am I saving money? Am I saving the maximum? Am I, if I put the maximum into my 401k plan at work, have I started an IRA or savings? You can make automatic savings from your bank account into an individual retirement account if you don't have a company to do it for you. Am I saving at least 10% of my salary? And I know many people are going to be shuddering when they hear that because they're not, and they say, I can't do it. But start with five. You could, everybody can save 5%. Start with five, go to seven, go to ten, uh, bit by bit, and watch that money grow. So when you're in your 30s, your 40s, you want to be aimed towards saving as much as you can, or saving more than you're saving now, even if you just save a little bit extra every year. By your 50s, 60s, you should be actually doing a budget, saying how I want to live, how much it's going to cost me, and how much will my savings allow me to do, and what kind of changes might I have to make in my life in order to live on the savings I have. Now, you list several retirement calculators, and in fact, I posted two of the links to two of them on today's radio wrap-up. One is for Analyze Now, and the other one is for the AARP. 
And now those are calculators for helping to decide when you should start taking Social Security. And that's a huge question for people. And, um, I, and there are some others in the book that I would only cost $50 and I think are very, very much worth it. Social Security Solutions.com, Social Security Choices.com. Those are wonderful services where you can put, send in, you, you know, fill out a little thing saying, this is how old I am, this is what I want to retire. Um, uh, and when should I best be taking my Social Security? Because a lot of people take Social Security at 62, and, of course, you get a 25%, 30% discount then, and that's true for the rest of your life, and it might be Yeah, that's the time better. when you don't want a discount, right? <laughs> you know, absolutely. <laughs> you, you, much better, much better to work longer and build up a higher Social Security account. But if I can, can suggest to you a couple of um, free places where you can use a calculator to figure out uh, what we were just talking about, of um, how much money you need to save for retirement, um, I can give you two you might like to post. One is T. Rowe Price's um, Retirement Income Calculator, and the other is Fidelity Investments Retirement Income Planner. You have to sign up for them, but they're free, so you don't have to pay anything. Okay. And they can be very, very, those two can be very helpful. And you put in your income, you put in how old you are, you, you put in you know, various financial things, and that will give you a pretty good idea of how much you have to save, or if you can't save that, um, then you have to make choices about how you're going to live. So those are two sets of calculators. One saying, when is the best time to take Social Security so I will maximize how much I'll get. And the other one is how do I look at my savings today and how I'm going to live and how do I work out um, whether I'm saving enough to retire. So let's go for a break. We're going to take a break and we'll get back to you. You're listening to the Friday Happy Hour. Remember when you wished you had more time for yourself and now you have it? But you notice you're keeping busy with stuff, but that stuff isn't making you feel happy or filled up. And when you think about what would make you happy and filled up, you get stuck or feel overwhelmed. And then you go back to what's more familiar, more comfortable, even if it's not making you happy. Wouldn't you love to find a way to start making sense of that deep discontent you're feeling? Well, you're not alone. I'm Anne Marie Kelly, author, victory strategist, and the radio show host of the Friday Happy Hour. And I know there's a place for you, one that other women have found to be both inspirational and empowering, and it's the Victorious Woman Project. Go there now and get on my mailing list, where you'll be the first to know about my upcoming online workshops, teleseminars, and more. And while you're there, take a couple minutes to look over my blog. You can download some of the free stuff I have for you and let it get your creative juices going. I'm looking forward to meeting you at the Victorious Woman Project. And that's at www.victoriouswoman.com. Welcome back to the Friday Happy Hour. We've got Jane Frank Quinn back. And, Jane, we missed you. I know. <laughs> suddenly my phone service went down, and I tried to call you back, and I had no dial tone, and my Internet went down. <laughs> I was just trying to reach you on my cell when all of a sudden phone service seemed to come back up. So oh, Isn't that strange? We're, we're just going to have happened. to bring you back another time. We, I, I will be delighted to. I'm so sorry. To, you were talking to yourself there for a minute. I, I was frantically trying to get back. Well, the, what I was asking you was that was the one question that I that I thought was very interesting was that you say that you tell people to ask themselves, what do you want to, what do you want from Social Security? And, and, and that's the question I don't think I would have thought to ask myself. <laughs> well, you know that some people say, I want money right away. As soon as I can, I'll take it at 62, even though I know that uh, I'm going to take a big discount for the rest of my life. And, and you may be in a financial position where that's what you have to do. But then I always, when people say that, I always say, do you really have to do that? Because maybe you say, I want to get 
get the most out of Social Security I can, and I expect to live a long life. I'm healthy. And so then you say, if I wait until my full retirement age, 66, I will get much more money in a, a per year, and that's probably going to be worth it because I'm going to work you know, maybe it's till 65, 66 anyway. And then if you're a married couple, you might say, well, what's the most as a married couple I can get? And if you're, say, say you're a wife who didn't have much Social Security for herself and your husband has more. And if he works until, or doesn't, call, I should not say work, waits until 70 before he collects Social Security and then he dies, he will be leaving you the maximum survivor benefit. So a man or a husband might think, well, I'm going to put off taking Social Security till 70 because this is going to be the best deal for my wife if I die first because I'll be leaving her the most I can possibly leave her. So there are many ways of looking at this uh, Social Security decision, and that's why I recommend those um, uh, places that you go to for Social Security to, because they help you answer answer those questions and you know I'd suggest that you post those other two places that I mentioned that cost $50 mm-hmm. to take a look at. Uh, Analyze Now is a good site, but it's quite complicated, whereas the others are much simpler. And it was T. Rowe Price and... Uh, yeah, T. Rowe Price and Fidelity are for um, people who are trying to figure out how much money they need to spend. And, and since you have the book there, I can tell you it's on page 26. There you go. <laughs> and then... On, and I will post it on the radio wrap-up. And then for... Um, for for Social Security, there are those sites that cost $50 that I think are are really, really worth the help because they really help you to say when, in terms of what I need to know, uh, when would be the best age to take a Social Security benefit. So um, those are the ones that are socialsecuritychoices.com and, and uh, socialsecurity.com. So you'll... So I would recommend that you post those as well because okay. I think they are really good sites and they are so helpful to people because it's just completely confusing. When's the best time for my spouse to take it? When's the best time for me to take it? You know, you don't realize that there are so many options and it makes a difference to how much money you're going to have for the rest of your life. By the way, and that's on page 67. Okay. <laughs> 26 book. and 67, I will put. I was, I was just paging <laughs> through it to find the find the pages. Uh, that I think for people who are retiring and thinking about Social Security maybe for the first time, th- th- those services are the most valuable that they can look at to figure out how they get the most from the, from the social, so, social Security taxes you've paid all your life. And people don't know those places exist, and they're wonderful. Well, something else that I know that a lot of, a lot of women don't know, that if they've been ma- and men, if they've been married before and they were married for 10 years, they can collect on their ex-spouse's Social Security. Absolutely. You can collect as a spouse. You can uh, collect as a survivor. Uh, and you don't even have to let your spouse know about it. You go to Social Security, and you bring. You have to bring your marriage certificate and your divorce certificate, uh, and uh, along with your birth certificate and the other things Social Security wants you to have when they put you on the Social Security record. And um, if you've lost those papers, you can, because you get divorced, divorced years ago and you're, you were so mad you threw, threw your divorce papers yeah. away. <laughs> um, there are vital, your, the vital statistics office of the place where, you know, the county or the place where you got divorced, you can get those papers replaced and um, uh, Social Security, as I said, they'll even direct you to where to get these vital statistics and you can get that. And, and by the way, it, it doesn't make any difference if, you're, if your husband is remarried, his current spouse gets Social Security, and you as the ex-spouse get Social Security, and it doesn't take anything away from, from either spouse. So if, you're, if you are a, a second wife, you don't have to worry that you'll lose something because the first wife is applying, and if you're the That's first right. wife, you mm-hmm. get the same thing or the, the, the second wife gets. Now, Jane, one of my Facebook friends asked an interesting question. She wants to know how to plan to die broke, and what she wrote was this. 
I want to make sure I'm spending wisely, enjoying my life, but not being overly frugal. Is that possible? I completely agree with her. Um, you don't want to die totally broke because, of course, you don't know when you're going to die. And if mm-hmm. you say, I, I'm aiming to be out of money at 80, and there you are at 85 and you're still taking yoga, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> you, you don't want to be in that kind of position. But this is a way of thinking about your money. Some people feel that, oh, I have to leave my money to my kids. I, I've saved all my life. I'm going to continue to save. I don't want to spend any money. I want my children to get it. And, you know, that's an attitude some people have, and I, I have no problem with it. You know, that's, that's how they feel. But I don't quite feel that way myself. I feel that I worked really hard for this money, and I want to live comfortably. And uh, my children will get something when I retire, but that's not the primary or when I die. But that's not my primary focus is uh, making sure there's money there for my kids. So I think that when you figure out, you know, as in my book, and you work on how to make your money last and how much you can afford to spend, you can look at it strictly in terms of I want to make sure I have enough money so that if I'm alive at 100, I'm still living okay. Mm -hmm. And you work that out, and if there's anything left for your kids, fine. If not, fine. Because too bad. That's not what. That's not what. That's not what matters to you. So that's well, that Jane. That's really good. And excuse me, we're going to have to have you back. And I, I think I have an opening for next month. And maybe when I get back to my office on Monday, I will check in with you and maybe we can schedule well, something let's, else. Let's check in again and see if we can... Uh, I'm in... We have a house uh, north of New York City in the country and uh, that's where I am now and I'm afraid somewhere somebody clipped a wire somewhere. So, <laughs> so we'll do this country, again, so. Anne-Marie. And my best to all of your listeners and thanks for staying, staying with it. Well, uh, we were out. Well, thanks for coming and we'll talk again, Jane. Thank my you pleasure. very much. Bye-bye. And to, for all of you listeners, I, we're going to close with a with a quote from this is I love this. It's one of my favorites from Catherine Hepburn, who said, "If you're given a choice between money and sex appeal, take the money. As you get older, the money will become your sex appeal." So now, you victory chicks and you guys, that's some motivation for not retiring too soon. Listen, have a great and victorious weekend. Sorry about the technical problem. We'll make up for it with Jane another time. Thanks for coming, and I'll talk to you next week. Jen's on. Thanks for listening to this Friday Happy Hour. Make sure you subscribe, rate, and review today's show. And join us again next week for the Friday Happy Hour with Anne-Marie Kelly.